Hello and welcome to the third in our series of an introduction to systemic pathology. In this tutorial we're going to be covering um, quite a complex area. We're going to be covering renal pathology. Of course you can follow us on Twitter at BitesizePath and if you like you can press the subscribe button down in the corner there. So what are we going to cover today? Well we're going to describe the features of the nephrotic syndrome and then we're going to talk about causes in children and adults and then we'll move on to talk about nephritic syndrome. So the first part of this tutorial we're going to be covering some of the complex glomerulitis and hopefully um, demystifying those a little bit. Then we'll talk about polycystic kidney disease and how it manifests clinically and then talk about the common types of renal tumour that you're likely to come across in practice. So what is nephrotic syndrome? Well, it's actually a triad. It's massive proteinuria, massive amounts of protein in the urine. It's hypoalbuminemia as a result of that, losing all that protein. And of course, that's going to change the oncotic pressure in the vessels and lead to disruption in starling forces, which will subsequently lead to edema. And typically in children, this will be sort of periorbital edema, scrotal edema, but you'll also get your sort of uh, puffy face appearance. You get swollen legs ascites, all the things that we associate clinically with edema could be present in nephrotic syndrome. And patients may often comment that their urine appears more frothy than normal, and that's because of the large amounts of protein in it. So what is actually happening? Well, remember that the kidney has as its centre this glomerulus structure, which is a modified capillary bed. And this has got a fenestrated epithelium, uh, sorry, fenestrated endothelium um, that allows uh, small molecules to filter through. But what it normally does is it stops proteins from getting through. And that endothelial layer is lined as well by a basement membrane, which is again selective. And also you have these cells that surround the glomerulus called podocytes. And these have foot processes. And again, they act as a filtration barrier as well. And what happens in diseases that cause nephrotic syndrome is you get disruption um, to the glomerulus, to the basement membrane, to the podocytes, and that filter essentially becomes bigger. I always imagine the glomerulus a bit like a colander, and then the holes become so much bigger so everything starts to fall through. So you end up with protein in the urine. And the disease processes, to sum it up, are all doing that. It doesn't matter what's causing nephrotic syndrome, there is some disruption to the glomerulus that now allows proteins to leak through. And subsequently, if you're losing proteins, you can think about some of the complications that are likely to happen from nephrotic syndrome. So if you're losing protein, you're going to lose antibodies because they're proteins. And so as a result, people can end up being immunosuppressed and have to receive vaccines for certain organisms. So they have to have the pneumococcal vaccine, etc. Also, you're going to lose some of your anticoagulation factors. So as a result of that, you, use things like, you lose things like protein C and protein S in the urine. Now what will happen as a result of that is you will be more predisposed to forming blood clots. So there is an increased risk of thrombosis in patients with nephrotic syndrome. Also, if you think about the fact that albumin has depleted in the vascular space, then you've got less things for lipids to bind to. What will happen is you'll have an increase in circulating lipids and also the liver increases its synthesis of lipids in response to that and you can end up therefore with hyperlipidemia. So patients with nephrotic syndrome are at an increased risk of having immune suppression, increased risk of having thrombosis, and also an increased um, lipid count, so they end up with hyperlipidemia. So they are complications that result from nephrotic syndrome. So what actually causes it? Well, in children, the commonest cause is in fact something called minimal change disease. Now the cause of this is still somewhat unclear but what we know is if you took a biopsy from these children as, as, as may be done then you wouldn't see much on H&E microscopy so standard light microscopy you wouldn't see anything hence the name but if you put that sample through an electron microscope and looked at the podocytes then you would see that the foot processes become disrupted they become what's called effaced and that, that's essentially what's happening here there's also potentially some problems in the basement membrane proteins as well but the good thing is that most of these children are steroid responsive. So if you have minimal change disease as a child, then giving you a course of steroids will often fix the problem. That cannot be seen, uh, said, in adults. So adults that have minimal change disease don't seem to be a steroid responsive, but we're not sure why. Now, I looked quite extensively to see what the commonest cause was in adults. Some say a condition called focal systemic glomerulosclerosis, which we'll talk about in a second, but other sources seemed to say that this was systemic disease that could cause nephrotic syndrome, and that was more common. 
So this isn't a primary diagnosis of the glomerulus, but this is a secondary cause due to systemic disease. So I'm thinking systemic diseases majority are going to be due to diabetes, but also things like amyloidosis, which is a systemic disease, could lead to it as well. So in this case, you're having systemic diseases that actually damage the glomerulus. So your clinical presentation may be related to a patient that's had diabetes, etc., in the past. Um, but in children, the commonest cause by far is minimal change disease. So other important causes of the nephrotic syndrome, focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, or FSGS. So this is essentially all in the name. There is a focal segmented area of the glomerulus that becomes affected by sclerosis. And you can see it on that light microscopy image on the left. You can just see towards the right uh, of the in the glomerulus there, you can see this thickened area of endothelium. Uh, and uh, you can see sclerotic changes in the glomerulus there. And it's just essentially a segment that can cause that. Now, there are a number of things that can cause this. Some include toxins, heroin can lead to FSGS, um, vasculitides can lead to FSGS, you can also get it in HIV, you can also get it as a result of hypertension. FSGS is essentially an important cause of nephrotic syndrome in adults. So you need to consider this as a diagnosis if there's only, if the description or the microscopic description to you is that only a small area of the glomerulus is affected, and it's isolated to that region and there's sclerotic tissue there, then that's FSGS. What you can see on the right here is something called membranous nephropathy. Now this is to do with antibodies being mounted to something called phospholipase in the basement membrane. Um, this is an immune mediated condition and again it's damaging that basement membrane so that you're ending up with essentially um, a, a reduced filtering ability and protein is leaking out and leaking through. Now this can be primary due to the immune effects or it can be due to systemic diseases or due to other things as well. So this is where it all gets quite complicated because lots of them cross over. So like vasculitides can cause FSGS, they might be able to cause other types of nephrotic syndrome as well. So what I'm covering here is a summary of the main causes of nephrotic syndrome. So in terms of nephrotic syndrome, we can split those into primary causes, where it's the disease of the glomerulus itself, or secondary causes, where it's due to systemic disease. The primary causes of those in children, minimal change disease is the most important. Um, focal segmental glomerulosclerosis is important in adults, and membranous nephropathy as well. Secondary causes due to systemic disease, such as diabetes or others like amyloidosis. And that's really important in adult cases of nephrotic syndrome. So you need to think of what could be the secondary cause of what's happening here. There's also another one called membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis, but that crosses over into the next topic that we're going to talk about, which is nephritic syndrome. So nephritic syndrome. Nephritic syndrome is different from nephrotic syndrome. In this case, we have red urine, we have hematuria. We also have proteinuria again, but not to the same extent of um, the nephrotic syndrome. Hypertension, high blood pressure is a result of the nephritic syndrome. Azotemia, this is just a build up basically of nitrogenous waste products. And edema. You'll also see in the textbook them talk about um, blurred vision as well in patients that have nephritic syndrome. What is happening here? Well, in this poorly done diagram by myself, you can see that what's happening is essentially, the, I've tried to make the capillary more red there, it's angry, it's an inflammatory process, that's the key, key word in nephritic syndrome, it's inflammation of the glomerulus that's going to lead to bleeding and it's going to lead to proteins being released as well, so you're getting some breakdown of the glomerulus but it's mostly the inflammatory changes that result in blood being leaked into the urine which shouldn't normally be there but red blood cells are cast into the urine and you can see what's called red cell casts in the um, urine under the microscope. So nephritic syndrome is important and distinguish it from nephrotic syndrome in the fact that we have this hematuria, we have this buildup of nitrogenous waste products. You also get hypertension in nephritic syndrome uh, as a result of the damage in the glomerulus. So there are a number of things that can cause nephritic syndrome. So this can again get a little bit complicated. Probably one of the most important ones that tends to crop up in exams particularly are infections with group A streptococci. Now, these include things like um, 
strep throat, so pharyngitis, but also streptococcal skin infections that are caused by an organism called Streptococcus pyogenes. This has got sort of a string of pearls appearance under the microscope. And what Streptococcus pyogenes does is it causes a little bit of a delayed immune reaction in the kidneys. So typically a few weeks after the person has had an infection such as pharyngitis or a skin infection, um, like a cellulitis, then they will develop hematuria, they'll develop hypertension, they'll develop proteinuria, and that's uh, streptococ glomerulonephritis due to streptococci, so we call it post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. A lot of the immune-mediated uh, vascular disease, like lupus, um, can result in glomerulonephritis. Um, so this really is due to a systemic disease. There's also another one called Burgess disease or IgA nephropathy. Um, and this is where you're getting IgA antibodies that are attaching to the basement membrane. And you'd see immunofluorescence positivity for IgA antibodies if you did that. But essentially, this is an immune-mediated cause of glomerulonephritis. One sort of immune-mediated uh, cause is anti-GBM disease which if you find that the person has hematuria and also has hemoptysis, that combination we refer to as good pastures syndrome. And that can, again, prop up on exams particularly. You can have the scenario of somebody that has hematuria but also has uh, and, uh, an AKI, an acute kidney injury, because that's what can happen in these patients. And also they have hemoptysis and essentially the same process is going on in the lung and breaking down the lung and you end up, as a result, with good pastures disease. Now, another important cause that, again, can crop up in exams, but is an important one to know, is hemolytic uremic syndrome. Now, in he hemolytic uremic syndrome, this is particularly post-gastroenteritis. It's particularly post-infection with an organism called E. coli 0157. So, often in the history, there's somebody that's, that's had diarrhea or gastroenteritis type presentation with bloody diarrhea. Um, usually in the scenarios that are given it's things following a barbecue or something along those lines, eating beef, eating certain green vegetables where it was found. Um, but HUS results in this triad of um, hematuria, um, so glomerulonephritis. Um, you end up with hemolytic anemia and you also end up with thrombocytopenia. So if the blood count is indicative of that, then you're thinking that this could be HUS. So that's an important cause as well due to infection with E. coli 0157. HSP, Henoch Schonlein Purpura, um, causes a, a vasculitis, it's essentially a vasculitis in children. And um, what you end up with are abdominal pains, joint pains, and also a non-blanching purpuric rash that affects the thighs and the buttocks. So it's often a cause of panic because it's in the differentials for meningitis. Um, so children that present with this presentation but also then have immaturia distorted renal function, this could be HSP. So classical presentation is usually it's a young boy um, that presents with uh, a non-blanching purpuric rash affecting the thigh and the buttocks and also has immature and distorted renal function and that HSP is in the cause, important cause of nephritic syndrome. There's another important cause that's actually being shown in the background there. Um, any of these, I suppose, can, can, can result in a rapidly proliferating uh, glomerulonephritis, what we call RPGN. That's probably a topic for another video because in itself it can be split into three categories of which there's certain immune conditions like um, Cianc positive um, vasculitis, etc. But essentially just know that RPGN can result in quite rapid decline in renal function and is important to stop. But we'll perhaps talk about that on another day. So that is glomerulonephritis. Important things, hematuria, proteinuria, um, azotemia, hypertension, very, very important, and then those important causes. So polycystic kidney disease. Now, the first thing to say is that most of us do develop cysts on our kidneys. Um, when you do post-mortems, it's not uncommon uh, to find uh, benign renal cysts. But some people are predisposed to developing multiple renal cysts. And if you develop lots of them, then that can lead to impairment in your renal function. And there are two genetic conditions that are important to discuss. The first is autosomal dominant, 
or adult polycystic kidney disease. Now this is due to mutations in the PKD genes, which code for proteins called polycystins, polycystin 1, polycystin 2, and those genes are located on chromosomes 16 and 4. These are autosomal dominant mutations, so they, tend, they don't skip a generation. Um, but essentially, the patient develops multiple cysts. Now, they won't actually present until they're in chronic renal failure, unless somebody spots that they have uh, massive kidneys, because the kidneys are huge, and we'll see a picture in a second. Um, so unless you can feel the kidneys, or they present with abdominal discomfort, etc., then um, they very rarely present. They tend to be asymptomatic until they've developed um, quite significant renal failure. Uh, and have to go on to be dialyzed or have renal transplants. But this is really quite important. So there is an association in autosomal uh, dominant polycystic kidney disease with developing cysts in other organs. So with the pancreas and the liver are other important places. The spleen as well, I believe they can make cysts, and I might be wrong on that. Um, and there's also an association with uh, berry aneurysms. So Commonly, there may be a history in the family of somebody having a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So that's really important. Or indeed, it could be the first presentation in poly polycystic kidney disease. Um, but that accounts for a mortality of about 10% in patients with polycystic kidney disease. So it's important to appreciate that that is a potential um, complication of the disease. Now, there is another form, also more recessive polycystic kidney disease. This is sometimes called childhood polycystic kidney disease. Children, babies that have this, very rarely survive beyond the perinatal period. And that's because the kidneys don't function very well in utero. So as a result, you don't produ produce much amniotic fluid. And as a result of that, you, so that's called oligohydraminos, where you've not got enough fluid. As a result of that, there's no fluid to swallow for the lungs to mature and develop. So they actually develop pulmonary hypoplasia. They're born with underdeveloped lungs, and it's the respiratory distress that tends to lead to their death. So children with autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease very rarely survive beyond the perinatal period. So autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease is, is quite serious. This is what adult polycystic kidneys look like. This is uh, an image taken from Wikipedia. Sorry, the image credit isn't in the corner there. Um, but this just shows you how big the kidneys can become and how many cysts develop on the kidneys. So it just completely distorts the renal architecture. And you can see why that will significantly reduce your renal function over time. So that's essentially very, uh, a very gross distortion of the, of the kidneys. So let's talk about renal tumours. The first one I want to talk about is this tumour here, which is a Wilms tumour, or as we call it, posh word, nephroblastoma. This is one of the commonest tumours in childhood. It generally has a good prognosis if it's histologically favourable. So um, a Wilms tumour, um, of course, would be a, a devastating diagnosis for a family um, to, to know that their child has cancer, but generally has, it has quite a good prognosis if it's caught early enough. The presentation, particularly in stems of questions and things, will be an abdominal mass that's painless and doesn't cross the midline. Compare that to the presentation of a neuroblastoma, where it does cross the midline, so that the, the two are in the differential there. But essentially, we, we, we treat that surgically, so that's one for the uh, paediatric surgeons to uh, operate on. So that's just a, a very quick overview there of a Wilms tumour, um, just because it, it tends to come up in, in medical student exams. So what about renal carcinoma? Well, renal carcinoma um, is mostly of a clear cell type. So what you can see here is on the right-hand side of that image, um, you can see some cells that have got sort of a granular cytoplasm, a clear cytoplasm, uh, but some abnormal nuclei in there. And this is an example of a clear cell renal carcinoma. Now, there are other types of renal carcinoma, one of which is chromophobe carcinoma, um, which has got sort of a more eosinophilic cytoplasm and a pinkish cytoplasm. Um, but the most common type is a clear cell carcinoma. You can also get transition cell carcinomas as well. And if you remember, the urothelium is a transitional epithelium. That lies the ureters, it lies the bladder. You can get transition cell carcinomas as well. And you can get tumours of all of those anatomical structures as well. But risk factors for um, 
renal cell cancer are smoking, particularly very strong risk factor, obesity, which is really important, and a genetic condition called von Hippel-Lindau disease, which I won't go into any great detail about. There's also um, an association with certain industrial dyes um, and a certain exposure to those. Now, the important thing about renal cancers is they can spread through the bloodstream. They do so by metastasizing through the renal veins. Now, that's problematic because if you have involvement of the renal vein, that very quickly connects to the inferior vena cava. So that's a very easy way for renal uh, tumors to spread. And one very common place they will spread to is the lungs, where you will get these multiple nodular lesions on the lungs, and it leads to a characteristic presentation that we refer to as cannonball metastases. And you can get mediastinal involvement, and this is it's really not pleasant. Patients are sort of intractably coughing all the time, and, it, and it's really, really uncomfortable. But just know that metastases is important. Now, if you have involvement of the renal vein in a man, that's important because the left gonadal vein comes uh, drains into the left renal vein. So what can happen is you can get a varicocele. So any men that presents with a, 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 a sort of swollen veins around the testes, known as a varicocele, the sort of testicular venous plexus that's around there, then you need to think, could this be the presentation of a renal cancer? That has to be ruled out with any man that's presenting with a varicocele, particularly on the left side, because the left gonadal vein drains into the left renal vein. It could be the involvement of the renal vein in a renal cell cancer. And in uh, radiological reporting of renal cell carcinomas, you will see them referring specifically to whether there's involvement of the renal vein. The classical triad of clinical presentation in renal cancers is abdominal pain, an abdominal mass, and hematuria. However, that triad barely ever presents together. You instead get this painless hematuria, and that's a red flag in anyone. Anybody that's got painless hematuria needs to be investigated for whether or not they could have a potential malignancy. So that's about renal cell cancer. Most important things you need to know, most of them are clear cell carcinomas. The risk factors that are important are obesity, this genetic disease called von Hippel-Lindau syndrome, and industrial dyes, and smoking. Importantly, it doesn't always present with that triad, but abdominal pain and abdominal mass and hematuria is important, but painless hematuria is by far the more important one to think about and it can metastasize through the bloodstream, particularly to the lungs, via the renal veins, where you will get what's called cannonball metastases. And remember that if there is involvement of the renal vein in man, can lead to a varicocele. So that's important. So, whistle-stop tour of an introduction to renal pathology. We've talked about nephrotic syndrome and its common causes. We've talked about nephritic syndrome, and again, its common causes. We had a brief discussion about polycystic kidney disease and how it manifests clinically. And finally, we talked about some common types of renal tumour. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, please do follow us on Twitter, subscribe on YouTube, follow the channel. Um, our next video will be introducing gynaecological pathology. Um, so hopefully we'll see you for that.